Welcome back, listeners. It's great to be back in the studio to kick off our 2024 season, and I really can't think of a better guest to join me for today's show. Before I introduce her, let's start with some background. To start this season, we're doing a series on healthcare leadership. Specifically, I'll be drawing on the theory of schools of experience. If you haven't heard of this theory, it highlights that one is not born a leader, and there are not innate talents that candidates either have or don't that can predict their success. But instead, across their work and life experiences, leaders' abilities are developed and shaped. So in essence, their circumstances help them to gain the experiences and the skills that they need to lead. Now, instead of looking for innate talent, the schools of experience perspective looks to see whether potential leaders have wrestled with the problems similar to the ones they will need to solve in their new job. In short, when it comes to being a successful leader, the experiences that one gains throughout their life courses, the schools, matter more than any inborn traits. With that background, I'd like to introduce you to today's guest. I'm grateful to be chatting with Dr. Jean Wright, whose experience and expertise highlights how this theory plays out in the real world. I'm so happy Jean is here to share her leadership lessons with you. And it's impossible to do Jean justice in a short intro. So despite already admitting defeat, I'll, I'll give it a quick try. Now, Dr. Jean Wright is the CEO of the COPD Foundation. And prior to this role, she served as the Chief Innovation Officer at Atrium Health, now known as Advocate Health. She was also the Chief Medical Officer of their CMC Northeast and CMC University Hospitals. Prior to these roles, she was the Vice President of Children's and Women's for Memorial Health and the VP of Medical Management at CHOA. In addition to being wickedly smart and incredibly wise, Jean is an amazing team builder, quite funny and impeccably kind. So Jean, thank you for being here today. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That was, that was intriguing and I've never heard impeccably kind, but I would, I would aspire to that. And I can't think of someone I would rather talk to this afternoon than you. So I always look forward to our conversations and they go everything from parenting to the mom and career work-life balance, which is really, really hard to the hard truth of business innovation to innovation itself. So let's have at it. Awesome. So listeners know that I like to start with why. Could you share why you wanted to become a chief innovation officer and how you came to lead the innovation engine at Atrium Health? I don't think anyone wakes up and says, the light bulb's gone off. I want to be a chief innovation officer. You know, I've never seen one of my kids dress up like that, you know, for school <laughs> career day. I'm not even sure I knew that that existed. But during President Obama's time, he created something called Beacon Grants. He felt that there were communities that were beacons of light, that were making advances in health IT, health information technology. And I was fortunate enough to lead one of those 17 grants. And one of the things about that grant that was eye-opening for me was it wasn't like all the randomized control trials I'd been involved in in the past. It wasn't hypothesis testing per se. It was, let's get out there in the field. Let's work with the patients. Let's work with the hospitals. And let's see what works. Let's try something different. Now, we weren't putting cancer patients at risk or, you know, withdrawing anesthesia from folks, but, you know, what if we put monitoring of patients in every room of the hospital, not just the ICU? How might we, right? Sound familiar? How might we, a phrase beloved by innovators, make the hospital a safer place. I didn't have to do a randomized controlled trial. I could use things that exist. I could innovate, right? And I could begin to make a difference. And I saw that, wow, those randomized controlled trials for my research background took too long. They often didn't make big change and they didn't involve patients as end users or nursing staff or whoever was going to live with it and work with it, it didn't give them a voice. So 
you know, that was one of my schools of experience. I had this very unstructured demonstration grant money. At the same time, kind of in another sphere, the phrases of design thinking were coming into the world of healthcare. Mm -hmm. you know, I love the phrase, how might we? How might we use design thinking to maybe not just create a better grocery shopping cart, like everyone's seen that video on YouTube, right. but how might we create an experience for patients with Alzheimer's when they come to the doctor's office for the first visit? Mm -hmm. I think Alzheimer's, you and I went down that path and you know, my, my family is caring for someone with Alzheimer's and here we were standing in the clinic and somebody's asking the patient with Alzheimer's what their name is, what their age is, what their date of birth, their social security. Okay, they have Alzheimer's. That's why they're there, right? But we had to walk through it with the patient experience. So design thinking, and I just was getting frustrated that quality improvement and some of the other initiatives mm -hmm. around making healthcare better were not, were not bringing about change fast enough. So. Um, uh, the chief strategy officer and EVP approached me and said, we think you're different. Now, frankly, I'm not sure that was a compliment in the moment. But <laughs> he said, we think you're different. You're not like the chief medical officers that have come before you. We're going to call you the chief innovation officer. And would, mm -hmm. would you build out a division? And, you know, you were what, our third employee mm -hmm. in that. So there was another gentleman, myself, and I looked around and I have used to you know, running big hospitals and having big departments. And it was two of us. And you shortly thereafter, were kind of looking at each other like, where do we go from here? But that's how I got in. Frustration with the lack of change, seeing some new tools like design thinking, having had some success with the Beacon Grant. In fact, we ran 29 projects over three years one of them was on COPD, and I'm still leading the change based on some of the things we put in place there. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story. The, the need for speed, the need for the patient voice, the frustration with the status quo, that I see those threads through, through your story. And I can imagine that in some ways, the experience as a chief innovation officer was a helpful learning experience or a good course to take before becoming a CEO. How do you think that serving as a CIO set you up for success in the CEO role? When you sent me those questions to think about ahead of time, I found that one intriguing because I don't know that you would ordinarily put that in somebody's career path. Most CEOs come from being a CFO. So mm -hmm. the board thinks you can handle the money you should be able to handle this. Or if you're on a clinical program, you've done really well in your clinical enterprise, they make you CMO, and now you're in the organization. I think CIO taught me hmm, how to look at a horizon that was not yet defined. Because the reality of every CEO is tomorrow has not been articulated. And we're giving you a job to lead people into tomorrow. But, you know, tomorrow might be a new COVID. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow might be an outbreak of a war in a new place. Tomorrow might be a threat to our economy. Tomorrow might be a political upheaval. Remember the story of the person that was the CEO for the company that makes Tylenol? Yes. He'd barely gotten his name on the door. And what, within 48 hours? There was the tampering case, right? right? The moment that title's given to you, boom, right? You're landing, and you better land on, on two feet. I think some of the things about being a, CE, a CEO, I think some of the prep for being CEO that came from CIO was a simple thing called a think session. Huh. And so I don't think I had ever read that anywhere. I think we made it up. But what we wanted, if you remember, was a short group of people, not short people, but a short <laughs> meeting of people without an obligation to create a committee. Because in the big hospital right. system, once you create a committee, 
it's going to stay there to the end of this, you know, decade, at least, if not eternity. And I was afraid that if we got different people together in the same room, they might think it's going to be a committee Mm -hmm. or we might, this is a secret now, we might look at them and say, they're not very flexible. They're not really good on innovation. They're not the best person. But if they know they're only coming to one meeting, it doesn't give them a seat at the table going forward. Now, Mm -hmm. if anybody that was working in Atrium wonders why they never got invited to the second party, there's a secret. I can remember when we were first talking about Alzheimer's, we invited neurologists, because that's classically where they say, primary care, geriatricians, behavioral medicine. And there were some people we didn't invite back. But since we just used a think session, something low, low barrier to entry, but we could get the brains in the room and then we could step back and say, you know, I never really thought about, or we really, we really don't need behavioral medicine at this point right now because the psychiatric component doesn't come up. It gave us just a little taste of it, like most things do in innovation, a pilot, something like a cardboard model that we could play with it, then step back, step back, rethink it, and then jump back in. You know, I mentioned cardboard models. Remember the project we did on the cleaning project? (laughs) Now I'm so wedded to cardboard models because in that project, we built out what would be the ideal cleaning space for for the NICU. Our architects came in and they said, we used to poo poo this. We thought this was crazy stuff. We've learned that if you will do that first, build it out of cardboard, it shaved what, six months mm-hmm. off of their ordinary architectural cycle? Right. So I have my team now build a lot of things out of cardboard or make a drawing or make a really bad slide deck. And I think you might have been one of those people that struggle with it because you do excellent work. And one of the things about innovation is you, you got to do fast, bad, messy work. And bringing this back to being CEO, Mm -hmm. before you commit your organization down a new trajectory or a new business model, have a think session, you know, low impact, bring the people together. And then if you have an inkling that this is the right direction, de-risk it by making it out of cardboard. Or I was meeting with a big pharmaceutical company the other day, And I had made a bad, messy drawing. And I was shopping that idea to them. And could I have cleaned it up? Could I have remade it in Canva? Could I have gotten my art team to? Mm -hmm. But when I give it to them in the rough, messy way, the inhibition to give feedback drops, right? Mm Because it doesn't look all glossy. Um, they're, They're now going, oh, have you thought about this? Or we couldn't be the right person. I I really learned how to do that um, from being a chief innovation officer. I guess I'd also throw in, and you know, you probably get a prize every time we say the phrase "jobs to be done," right? No, but, but that would be good. <laughs> okay, jobs to be done. Ding, ding, ding. We get a prize. <laughs> I recently had our team figure out what's the job to be done. It, it's in the space around virtual pulmonary rehab, and it's a job to be done with the lens to use an Ann Summers phrase, a lens of the patient. It's a jobs to be done around a payer. How do we get these patients to stay at the highest level of performance and the highest quality of life? There's a job to be done around pulmonary rehab. I learned that, right, from being in in innovation. So those are all things that I have brought over into the new job. And sometimes if I couldn't even find people in my new company to do it, I brought people like you and some of our other team members in to help me. Wow. There's so many threads that you mentioned in that response that I wanna build off of. One that you said right at the beginning around CEOs don't usually come from chief innovation officers, they come from CFOs, but one of the things you learned as a CIO was how to look at a horizon that was not yet defined because tomorrow's not yet articulated. And as a CEO, it's your job to lead people into tomorrow. 
That was a really good quote. You should use that Ooh, again later. I like that. I, 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 I've never said that before, but I may say it again. You should. Yeah. It was quite good. I wrote it down. Uh, but the the ability to see into the future and to have the vision, I think you are spot on that that is critical for both a CIO and a CEO. And, and so much think about the emails that you and I have sent back and forth over the last couple of years where we said, we saw it, we nailed it, right? And then we see it coming to fruition. Yeah. We were trained to do that. We were trained to look into the future. Yeah. And, and the think sessions, I do remember those. It was a great way to get a lot of people in a room because people would defer if they thought it was committee membership for life. But also the building it out of cardboard, I remember that NICU design session and it did save six months because I remember at the end of the session, the architect was there and he was actually drawing out the plan on one of those big 3M stickies that you would stick on the, the wall. The What are those? Um, easels. Easels. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the One of those big easels. And we had all the stakeholders in the room. We had everyone from the architect who is going to have to bring it to life to the head of the children's hospital to the individuals who are actually responsible for cleaning bassinets and um warmers and that was that was really powerful it was amazing amazing and remember one of the things they wanted to add was they wanted pictures of the babies put in the cleaning room so they that. would stay motivated and remember why it's so important to do the best job possible. I don't think an architect might have thought about that automatically, but they did. You're right. Yeah. And that's that's back to what you said in response to the first question around the voice, the voice of the people you're designing for and, and the jobs to be done. So it's clear that the CIO role was a great experience, a great course to take to prepare you for the CEO position. Were there any roles along your journey that you maybe didn't enjoy at the time, but now you perceive as a useful school of experience. Yes. Um, in fact, I actually asked for one of them. I was emerging as a leader at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, and I had run the PEDS ICU, and I had run the PEDS ER, and then I had started a series of urgent care clinics and done the staffing for that. And everything I had done or was doing up to that point was a revenue generator. So it's not hard for the hospital administrator or the department chairman to love you, right? Because you're bringing in money, you're growing it. But I knew by that point I had gone to business school. I'd crossed the street to Emory Business School. And I tell people that's where I got my third eye, right? It's yeah. where I learned about informatics uh, or analytics as we'd call them now. And I actually took a formal course in innovation, which maybe later we can also talk about. Yeah. Um, but I knew that running a revenue center would make me popular and well-supported, but it wouldn't give me the chops that I really needed. So I asked for cost centers. I ran mm -hmm. utilization management. I ran case management. I ran quality. I ran infection control. Um, didn't run the laundry, but almost everything short of that. And that really began to open my eyes to all the things that you needed to have. I also think, you know, later in my career, I went to uh, Savannah and had the opportunity to lead the Women's and Children's Hospital. And I developed, talk, talk about innovation and empathy, because we usually bring in the empathy word. I actually developed a lot of empathy for hospital administrators because I saw heads in beds, at least in that day and age before we move into value, right? It's what's creating revenue. Mm -hmm. I saw the cost of labor. I saw how some people come to work and they're a first year employee for every year for the next 35 years. And some people really grow mm -hmm. and you see that across time. I, I learned risk management differently because I sat across the table and um, were in lawsuits or settlements with mm. particularly parents whose child had had a bad outcome. I think all those things round you out and they cause you to think very, very differently. And I might not have wanted them, but I, I knew that I needed at least some of them. And I think 
you know, if, if there's a message in here, the broader your experience, the, the, and here we don't often get promoted for broad experience. We get promoted because we're deep in something. Like right. we started off in accounting and then we end up eventually as this, you know, CFO and then we're the CEO. But we've never done a tour of duty in marketing, right? Or we've never been on the front line in the ER during a COVID epidemic and seen people piled up out in the hall and realize, oh, now might be a good time to invent something like hospital at home. <laughs> so yeah. all the exposure to those other departments, and I know that you have more than healthcare listeners, but I would say whether you're working in a beverage company or a manufacturer, if you could do that tour of duty or at least a shadowing or some experience where you can really see deeply into other parts of an industry, it's really, really helpful. Yeah. So the, the breadth, not just the depth. Right. Awesome. Right. Now, is there an experience that you wish you'd had along your journey that you feel would have better prepared you to lead an organization? You just covered a lot of things, so there might not be any gaps, but if there are, what would you say they were? Um, mine would actually be specific to being in healthcare, hmm. but I'm sure there's analogies. Like I've already mentioned marketing. Most doctors think marketing is their name on the door <laughs> or their picture on the hospital webpage. And in fact, in my day and age, we thought it was inappropriate to bring attention to ourselves. Hmm. And so the fact, you know, there's a doc that lives four down, four doors down from me here in my neighborhood. He and his wife are both docs. They are masters at social imaging and social marketing. You might not need to go that far, but you know, you know, I'm looking for the patients who have COPD who have never been diagnosed. We call them the missing millions. Mm -hmm. It's not an inconsequential number. We know 30 million people have COPD. Half of them have never been diagnosed. That's kind of the equivalent of Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina rolled together. It's a really big number and, wow. and we can't get to them. If I knew marketing, right? Like good marketing companies do, I would know like how to use an influencer, how to connect with people. You think you'll remember when we were trying some campaigns around COPD early on when we had a little grant money, we put pictures of grandmas and and people going to their grandkids wedding and all that and mm, nothing right. took. And then one Friday afternoon, I think Elizabeth posted a picture of a dog and all of a sudden our numbers went up. That's when I learned about A-B testing. Mm. Right? I wouldn't have gotten that before. I didn't know about Facebook analytics and things like that. You know, right now I'm throwing things like spaghetti at the wall in TikTok because their algorithms work altogether differently. But had I had a chance to have you know, maybe it's marketing for dummies <laughs> or some three day course on everything you need to know about marketing. I, I think not only would it have helped me as a chief innovation officer, I think it would have helped me as a CEO because yeah. now I'm trying to learn that not just to have people understand the COPD foundation, which most people don't know, but we really want to get to the 15 million people that aren't diagnosed and the other 15 million to get their treatment and that approved, improved. That's marketing. And I have this huge gap. I'd also say um, pharmacy. If you think about it, in our innovation group, we did like Zippo work when it came to pharmacy. Mm -hmm. But when you look at where the spend is in healthcare, right? It's a huge spend. I didn't understand intermediaries. So there are things I wish I had known. There are tours of duty, schools of experience I wish I had had. Um, I wish I had gone, you know, it's like follow your boss for a day or take your daughter to work. Now, you know, personally, I want to be an offensive line coordinator for a football team for a day. Okay. So if there's anybody out there that can suit me up, I want to see what's on that piece of paper. <laughs> I want to know how you, you know, call in the place. I just am so thrilled by that, that I'm no offense 
because the Super Bowl is coming up. I'm really not watching the coaches or the quarterbacks. I'm watching those guys with those menus on the side calling the plays because honestly, there's a lot of analogy. Remember we, we said that great quote at the beginning is I'm trying to take people into the future. Right. Offensive line coordinators are taking people, players into a playing situation that they have never played against before. Oh, I see your yeah, light bulb. That makes me think of our uh, field trip Fridays that we used to take yes. in the innovation engine and the opportunities for analogous learning. And what can you learn from innovators or leaders in, in other fields? And I'd say that I think that was a huge uh, benefit and great school of experience or course that you had our whole team take because it continues oh. to be valuable today. Um, I, I think still remember from- us going into Avid Exchange and then some of you went into a place that creates sense for buildings. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I'm still taking my current team and sending them into places going, I know this sounds a little odd. I know this sounds, but please just go show up and see what happens. And it's amazing in the field that I'm in lung disease. A lot of folks have not gone into pulmonary function lab. They've not had spirometry done. I'm not talking about the patients. I'm talking about the thought leaders in the field, like go do that. And then see if you were a patient breathing through a straw, could you still do it? Yeah. I remember doing that with Dr. Howard for our virtual pulmonary rehab uh, pilot. I I did a spirometry test. It's not easy and I have normal lung function. Uh, So but yes, and you're a runner, you probably have even better than normal lung function. Yeah. I would also say, and this, this gets out on kind of the, woo, that's a bit of a stretch. You can almost pick something out of the blue and say, go find an analogy between the two. So I'm going to pick out helicopters, just literally out of the blue, because I saw one this morning, a helicopter. What does that have to do with COPD? When you give yourself a question like that, you allow your brain to fire in lots of different ways. And that discipline of doing it, remember how we would come back from those settings Mm -hmm. and we had so many neurons going off that had we tried to get there in a linear, logical way. um, I remember when we were part of the Innovation Learning Network, which was a a phenomenal experience that I think helped uh, accelerate our learning you would go to a different city, get on a bus, and we would go on a safari or a field trip. I learned so much by going to things that I never thought I would have a takeaway with. Right. But because I allowed myself to think differently, suddenly the analogies, you know, came to me. Did you feel that way on those trips? Oh, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Same, same with the field trip Friday. This is going to be, you know, uh, we have this long list of things that we need to do for work, but we were taking these two hours out of Friday and it's, and, but then I'd get back and say, Oh, it was, da, 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 it was so good. And, and I was always wrong. So uh, glad, glad that we did those things. My next question for you is actually a question that you used to ask in meetings uh, when we would meet with new potential partners or when we were about to embark on a new project, you would ask people across the table, what do you know now that you wish you'd known when you started? So what do you know now that you wish you'd known on your first day as a CEO? This is tough. All right. There's a long, long, long pause and you're probably going to cut this apart. I had heard that once you become CEO, like the Tylenol story and those things, your behavior gets measured, talked about, dissected Mm. differently. And I knew that in my head, but I didn't know that experientially. And I had to learn that everything I say, every eyebrow that goes up. Now, we're not General Electric. We're 52 people trying to change the world in lung disease. But I'm the CEO. Mm. So I have to be more guarded, more careful, more thoughtful. And I told the board, I had been on the board for six years, and I told them when we talked about me taking this on, that I am an innovator at heart. 
And so I'm going to bring that into the organization. And so buckle your seatbelts. If you think it's going to be same old, same old, you know, I'm going to try as desperately as I can to disrupt this, which I think, I think I'm making progress on that. But that change in demeanor that you have to have, you know, you know, humor is a big part of who I am. Yeah. Um, having a good joke, um, not at somebody's expense, but, you know, having fun, not taking myself too seriously, talking about my failures. Uh, I was telling somebody this morning that, you know, I aspire to be a Benet Brown. I aspire to, you know, live through a lens of vulnerability, but I can't in the Mm -hmm. same way as CEO. And that's tough for me. That's tough for me. Um, I do use a couple of people as coaches and as feedback and mm-hmm. as a source of putting the reins on. And I can imagine every CEO from a small organization to a really big one struggles with that. And I know we've had the chance, you know, at, at Atrium and Carolina's Medical Center before that to watch different people, um, you know, move to that level. And they really do have to. And the ones I've watched, you know, have done a magnificent job of it. But it's it's really really different, and they they weren't they weren't kidding about it. Hmm. Wow, hmm. it were it reminds me of something I used to hear consulting partners say, who they would go from being an engagement manager and leading their team to being the partner selling the work, and they would say, "Partnership's lonely, and it's different." I thought this would uh, be a more exciting role, but I realize I really miss the teams that I work with. To your point of, I knew like in my head that it would be different, but right. the experiential feeling is, is not always expected. I, I made a difficult decision recently and outsourced um, a department and it was really hard. Mm. And it's uh, a hard action to take. I think you and I have been talking about there's a hard truth, you know, of changing your business model. And I knew that I had to, and you've been, you know, a great uh, coach for me along the way on this and thinking through the dark nights of the soul. But then there's the implication on people and their families and relationships across an organization. You know, um, work isn't always all work. Sometimes it's baby showers. I remember having a baby shower, right? For you at the Innovation Island. I I remember, you know, selling celebrating people's children, you know, when Will's daughter got into Vanderbilt or when somebody else did something successful or when Jay went to Italy, all those things become the, you know, like that commercial, the fabric of your lives. And boy, you know, that, that's, that's a big change and it's, it's tough. And so, you know, you would probably say, then, then what do you do about it? I think you find a support group (laughs) Um, for me right now. It's the National Health Council. It's leaders of other not-for-profits that are face, uh, patient-facing organization. So the Alzheimer's organization, the CF Foundation, diabetes, all those kind of groups are together. Mm. And we, we face the same challenges, not only as CEOs, but in the voice that we have for patients. Like, Almost every patient in almost every form of life and form of disease struggles with the cost of meds Hmm. and the out-of-pocket spend, whether, remember how we studied it in behavioral health, the average uh, person in behavioral health goes through $400 worth of co-pays before their psychiatrist finds the right mixture of medications for them, $400 out of their pocket. And if you're blessed and you have a great job, you might go, well, that's just the learning curve we've got to go through. But for some people, that's that's groceries, right? right? Not just for a week, but for a month. Right. Um, and, and those things are, are really, really tough. You know, I thought you were going to ask me, what do I wish I had known before I became chief innovation officer? Well, that's perfect because my last question is there was, is there a question I didn't ask you? And what is it? And what's the answer? So there you go. You can answer that one. There we go. (laughs) I remember when I got that job, I was thrilled. 
right? I was, it was a party of one. <laughs> I, I went to a much more senior physician leader at the organization and he said, I think you just accepted the worst job in the company. Hmm. In fact, I don't think you'll be here in 12 months. I, I think I lasted, mm, what, 10 years? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a little bit longer than, than uh, 12 months. But I said, why is that? And he said, because your job is to fail. Mm -hmm. And we have these catchy phrases like, fail fast, fail often, right? Get your failure over, embrace failure. We had t-shirts about it. We went to ILN conferences about failing. We gave awards to people that failed, but we really didn't want anybody to fail. And it's still, right? Nobody wants to fail. Nobody wants to go, hey, mom, I spent a whole year failing. Aren't you really glad that I went to med school for that? It was really, really hard. And look at how many things that we tried. I remember a wonderful clinic that Ben and Jay outlined and it was supposed to be for a special ethnic group. I thought it was brilliant, and it never got launched. To no fault of theirs, but because of some other organizational priorities. And so, you know, we had hundreds of hours invested in that. Um, I remember when we were doing the COPD project, and we thought an integrated patient unit, you know, would be great. We had read Tysburg's book, although you probably read it because it's far too long for me to read, and I'm waiting for the movie to come out. But uh, Elizabeth Tysburg and uh, Porter had this magnificent treaty about how healthcare needed to be changed. And we tried to follow the rules of the book and patients didn't want it. Right? They didn't want a phone call to make the day that they got the diagnosis. So that, that failing fast, failing often, yes, it goes with that. I would also say, and, and I've said this to everybody that's followed after me, if you are going down the path of, of innovation, make sure you have a pot of money designated for you. I can remember taking a project because we didn't have that, as you recall. I had to go like beg, borrow, and steal for mm -hmm. funding for every project. Right. I wish I had a little pot over here where I could just, you know, spend it and try it and not tell everybody, but I had to go, you know, beg for it in, instead. I have seen some chief innovation officers and they could do more fast and they could fail fast. But I went to one of the senior physician leaders and I explained why we needed to do this. And he said to me, well, who else has done this? <laughs> I said, no one. It's innovation. It's ours. Like, we'll probably trademark it, patent it. I said, ooh, way too risky for us. No. Go wait till two other healthcare systems do it first and then you can do it. I think I'm going to work, work that one out. So, you know, I don't know how many specific innovators there are, or innovation leaders, but I would say that's the hard part for them is you do have to fail. You won't have success stories. Not everybody's going to invent the next Apple. Everyone likes to tell the story about Thomas Edison and the 999 ways it didn't work, but nobody wants to be Thomas Edison on number 247. Right. Nobody wants to be Tom Starzl, the brilliant liver transplant surgeon, because his first handful of liver transplants didn't survive. Hmm. Like, how do you go to somebody and say, I got this great idea. No one has lived through this yet, but I know at some point in the future, I'm going to get this right. And I hope it's you. You know, nobody does informed consent like that. So I'd say failure is a nice word. It's a lot harder to realize that's going to be your tattoo and trademark, right, in the organization. Hmm. That is a great line. Uh, I, I think you've had a few gems from this conversation that I hope you'll use again in the future. But Jean, I'm so grateful for your time today, for sharing your lessons learned and your expertise, for talking about the journey from before innovation through innovation to your current CEO role. And some things that I'd like to leave listeners to think about. The first one, you mentioned one of the things that drew you to innovation was the need for speed and the desire to hear more about the patient voice, to hear from the patient. 
And you have brought that into your current CEO role with getting your teams to think about the jobs to be done, uh, the patients you serve, the payers you work with, and the other stakeholders in your ecosystems. You talked about the importance of not just having depth of experience, not just going deep in your courses, but in going broad in the courses that you take and, and not to forget about marketing, because even if we don't all like to believe it, we're all selling something, right? In all of our leadership roles. So don't forget marketing. There is value in- Don't forget predictive analytics. You know, I was surprised <laughs> you, you hadn't would mentioned that, that yet. <laughs> Predictive analytics. You have to take a yes. course in that. Gene told me that right. multiple times. I'm still waiting to do it. Okay. But um, <laughs> one of the other things we talked about is the importance of analogous learning and what we can learn from innovators outside of our field. And if anybody wants to let Gene shadow them as an offensive line coach, please give her a call. But Gene, thank you for your time today. Thank oh, you for your lessons and your expertise. You. And thanks for so many great memories. You just took me down memory lane. Ah, good. We'll do it again soon. <laughs>